thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, so hi all. Thanks for having us here. Um, we are Jens and Chris. And uh, yeah, we are going now to talk about a new feature we contributed, uh, the flexible DAG trigger forms. But before we start, maybe a quick poll. Who knows already these flexible DAG trigger forms or is using them already? Okay, two persons. So uh, the good news is for the others, uh, you are in the right talk now to get to know it. And uh, for those who raised your hand, please stay. Uh, maybe you will learn something new as well. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's get started with where do we come from. So um, I'm a product owner and Jens is the technical lead of uh, the open loop testing for verification and validation uh, of highly automated driving functions at the Robert Bosch GmbH in Germany. And um, we are using here Airflow, especially for orchestration and scaling of these testing workflows. Um, testing workflows in our domain means um, we have different scenarios from real, e uh, real vehicle drives um, that we want to replay in newer software versions, in newer applications of these automated driving functions. And uh, yeah, we need to get these scenarios, pre-process them to fit to uh, the new system, replay the new system, evaluate them and report um, the KPIs so that the developers can go on working with it. Um, and scaling means uh, we have a lot of scenarios in the end we want to test. So we are talking here about several thousands of uh, driving hours uh, we need to replay. The use cases we are covering here with Airflow are uh, mainly that we um, have these scaled nightly validations every night generating new KPIs. Uh, we have smoke testing on a main branch to ensure uh, during PRs uh, the system isn't uh, broken. Um, we have hardware and software-based tests. So we have virtualized tests and on the real embedded hardware that is running in the vehicle later. And last, but uh, definitely not least, uh, we have parameterized manual testing and debugging, which happens during the development of the functions where the developers are directly running their new functions um, to see is it working, where do I have to see um, maybe to, to implement some more improvements. <laughs> Passwords, <so> sorry. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, so in the very beginning, when we started with uh, this orchestration framework, we had a lot of discussions about uh, why aren't you using CI, CI pipelines like Jenkins or GitHub Actions because they are existing in the project already. Um, but yeah, we did a lot of evaluations and uh, we came up with Apache Airflow as it best suits actually our use cases I have shown to you. So. Um, yeah, we decided to go with Airflow, but a problem in the beginning was, especially for this last manual use case, it was very hard for the users to understand how to configure um, the testing workflows, because in the beginning there was just this um, JSON UI form um, where the developer actually needs to know every param parameter of the stack. Um, yeah, to, to start the test, and this was very cumbersome for most of them, and um, they tend to use some other tools and not using our framework, which um, yeah wasn't what we wanted in the end. Uh, so we came up first with an own solution of a web UI. We wrote an own application that is using REST API of Airflow, but um, yeah, it's another application, it's very complex and hard to maintain, so this wasn't a solution for us in the end as well. Um, so next idea was, okay, maybe write a plugin to Airflow 
which allows us to define different parameters that must be set or are optional for our different testing workflows. Um, so yeah, we implemented this plugin and uh, the users really liked it because it was easier to understand uh, with the documentation we can provide with it. And because it was that nice to them, we decided, okay, let's contribute this uh, to the main Airflow um, core. And uh, yeah, what we came up with in the end is the flexible back trigger form um, that you can see here. So each deck can now have um, this trigger UI where when writing this deck, you can define what are the parameters that are needed with different types like a simple string text type, like a list or array types, or also enum types with predefined values. Um, for example, um, there are an enum of uh, scenarios we can run so the users can simply choose which to run. And another very good thing about it is it is very easy for the users also when they are implementing their own workflows to implement this trigger UI because this is automatically generated out of the params object of um, the DAG. So uh, when you are initializing uh, the DAG, you can um, generate objects from the params um, and uh, these params are then shown via the trigger UI button uh, to the user and you get uh, the same UI you have seen on the slide before. Um, and we can secure here our workflows because by the JSON schema check, which is behind it, um, yeah, we can also ensure that the config is always fitting to our workflows. And how this looks in detail, uh, now Jens will present. Okay, and um, not everybody has worked with the params object, um, and, and kind of when we initially generated the UI, initially we had a YAML file defining the UI, and that was reinventing the wheel, and then fortunate, uh, fortunately the params uh, object and the JSON schema checks came together at the point where we upstream contributed the idea. And uh, the params object is kind of just a dictionary, uh, which you see as an example on, on the left. So when you define a DAG, you define the params. Um, and this dictionary is um, um, yeah, presented. You can put plain text in it. And uh, Airflow during the DAG parsing will auto box values into param classes. And, and this auto boxing we, we took and leveraged a bit for the UI means um, depending on which param type you define, if it's a string or an integer, you see on this example on the right side, um, the, the corresponding field type will, will be made. So um, just define the dictionary and you, by doing not more than this, um, you automatically get the UI. Um, in this auto boxing, it's supported um, text, uh, integer, Boolean types, and list types. Uh, and list types are just rendered as a text box, so you can copy and paste a long list and don't need to have a lot of elements manually copied and pasted. Um, so this is the entry point, just define params. And limitations are uh, kind of, if, if we auto box the value, there's no type validation. We don't know what the user enters. Um, there's no label, no description, no big user support, but it's the entry point. And, and the idea is um, rather this structured params definition is, is maybe better than what was um, earlier on there with the Dagron conf, which is totally unstructured. So you don't know if it's scheduled, the no Dagron conf is passed, and you don't know what the user enters. At least here with the params, you know what you, you get as an entry. Um, but that's just the entry point, um, and um, yeah, low hanging fruit. Um, the other one is there's this param class and, and the, the documentation we will follow on. And the idea is that not you uh, for the params dictionary, you're not solely posting a key value, but the value is being defined as a parameter. And every parameter object has a default value, um, and you can have a type annotation, um, and a title, and a description. Um, those types and titles and description, this is coming from the JSON schema standard, and is a standard which was there already before in the parameters object. Um, behind the scene, um, these properties are used for schema validation. So if the type is integer, then also Airflow doesn't start the deck if it's not an integer. So if you would pass text, 
um, then uh, also via API or via command line, the DAG run uh, will be ignored and you get a type um, um, validation. So you don't need to handle that cases in your DAG and in your code. You can rely on Airflow taking care for this. Uh, and the benefit of this parent definition in schema standard is um, for the UI, we just took it and said, yeah, okay, that is a standard duty and we can render a user-friendly UI with it as because you don't want to have the manual trigger limited to technical experts. You want to give that maybe to somebody and he can just fill the values. And uh, with the title and the type, um, yeah, that's making it user-friendly. And, and, yeah. um, so the, the standard JSON schema will be validated. Um, um, here in this example, it's def defined to be type of integer, so it is also making this being required. JSON schema would not allow that you pass an empty value. Um, if you say type is integer, then it needs to be an integer. Um, um, so it's marked with a star automatically. If you have a type, it, it's mandatory. And labels and descriptions. Um, as a starting point, this is just following the JSON standards and schemes um, that was already there before. Um, but we added a bit more tweaking and many more options um, uh, from our daily life, as we saw that was not sufficient for the starting point. Um, so uh, one thing uh, that was already in the standard is that you can have also multiple times being specified. Um, so this example string and null means it could be null or string. With this being added, you mark the field as being optional. Otherwise, if you don't emit the null type, JSON schema will block you to submit. Um, and also in this example, you see beside description, you can pass description underscore HTML. And you can have a rich HTML code being added, which would be rendered in the description field. So you can have lists and formatting, highlighting, adding links, whatever you like to have in, in the description. So it will be rendered in the UI. Um, the enum option is also a um, function from the JSON schema. It um, limits down the validation of the value to the list items which are in the enum list. And as that any way from the JSON schema limits you, that's the perfect option. Um, on the right side, it renders a dropdown. So if you have enums, it will uh, make a dropdown list, uh, and the user can only select what, what is there. Um, and of course, the backend will validate this. Um, and this is for the values. Um, um, but kind of sometimes you have technical values like A, B, C, and nobody knows what A and B and C means. Uh, so um, we added a property called values display. Um, that values display is then making the user representative text so that you have a descriptive text what the user selects for and the technical value actually will go as param value in the back. Um, yeah, so um, many more options. The more you find in the documentation, but you can have kind of with a few lines of anyway deck definitions um, render a really cool, nice user entry form. Um, there's a lot of advanced stuff um, that is hitting now a 20 minute limit maybe. Um, so um, if you define date, date time objects, um, uh, type objects, um, this will show calendar pop-ups and you can select a time and you don't need to type the date and time manually but you have a date picker. Um, there are object types um, and object means like the previous JSON entry box, it will render a, a JSON box, it will um, validate on the UI already if the JSON is valid JSON so that you're not mistyping and submitting garbage. Um, there's an examples. Um, um, examples is uh, for proposals. Um, sometimes you see this if you do a Google search, you start typing and you get uh, proposals being submitted, what type you maybe uh, wanted to mention. The examples is like a relaxed enum. Um, you, you can give entry options for the user, but it's not forcing the user to use it, but it will show a pop-up in the browser so that you can um, have some examples, but you still can freely enter some text. Um, array that, that was contributed by somebody else is kind of usually free text, and you can have a text, and then it will be a list of strings. But there are also array types. Um, if you want to have a list of integers, um, you can force this, and then you will also get an, an object entry box for this. Um, then there's this cool feature of sections. Um, usually, if you have more than 10 parameters, that would be overwhelming. Um, and we also see cases where a lot of parameters are there. Um, sections mean it would render uh, areas of the um, dialogue and you can fold and unfold so that you have maybe advanced stuff and advanced parameters and standard parameters for kind of 90% of use cases and all the extras. 
um, const for constant fields. Uh, parameters can be changed, but sometimes you want to have parameters just exposed to be there, but user shouldn't change. Const is the option for, uh, and that's also coming from the JSON schema standard, uh, for values that are fixed and you're not allowed to change them, and so for const values will be hidden. Uh, they are just not shown, um, but actually they're at least described. And uh, pretty advanced stuff is, uh, unfortunately, too late, need the password again. Um, there's uh, the, the custom. Um, there's the custom HTML form, and that's the example on the right side. Um, that is in the tutorial deck um, um, that is also shipped with the standard code where you can have not yeah, the form generated by the backend code, but you can inject any arbitrary HTML you want to have as a form element. And the example is what is printed on the right side. You have three sliders where you can change the color and it generates a color code, which then is uh, submitted. Uh, and yeah, whatever you like to play with the HTML, you can put in. There's a lot more details and examples in the params documentation, and there's an example stack tutorial. Uh, feel free uh, to use it. And um, the last means I wanted to give um, yeah, a short overview how it has evolved. So uh, we had that idea as a plugin two years ago already, and uh, starting with 2.6, um, we contributed the initial version. Um, we had some fixes in 2.61, 2.63. Um, um, there was a kind of, yeah, as whenever a new feature gets introduced, you know, the bugs are there. We had other talks about this. <laughs> um, 2.7 was an, also a feature increment, and, and there was a bit of discussion before the release, and that was in, in former version, there was always a pop-up shown when you hit the trigger button to save with parameters or without. And um, in the AAP, which we followed, we discussed about how to handle this um, with the new trigger form, because sometimes you have parameters and sometimes you don't. The user probably doesn't know. Um, so we implemented an auto guidance. Uh, whenever there are parameters defined, it will show the form. And if uh, no parameters are, are there, then the deck is triggered without, because what to ask the user for if there are no parameters, so it's automatically triggered. Um, but that generated a bit of discussion, um, and the discussion ended up in there's now a configuration parameter we can turn on the legacy feature. So if you like the pop-up, um, you can enable that again. Um, also, uh, there are now multi-select boxes and uh, non-stripping arrays, yeah, bug fixes. Um, yeah. 2.71 uh, was also a bug fix, and um, there's also in the upcoming 2.72, um, there will be another bug fix for non-values. There was a problem of empty strings and none that was a bit inconsistent uh, in the fix. Um, nevertheless, it doesn't stop, and those UI things tend to be uh, uh, feature-rich, <laughs> and you never end up in getting features because UIs are complex. So it's it's a the approach is to be an 80-20 uh, coverage uh, Pareto principle, so it hopefully covers 80%, but still, if there's something missing, um, we have um, discussion about uh, required fields. Um, at the moment, the parameters which you define need to be um, um, consistent and JSON schema compatible in the defaults, um, which also yeah, has a problem if you want to enforce a user entering a value. Um, yeah, you need to provide a default which is already valid, and, and so there's a PR ongoing and discussion if we can take it off. Um, of course, that's needed for scheduled decks, but for manually triggered decks, we could also say the defaults are invalid, and the user need to fill something to make it meaningful. Um, so discussion was ongoing. Um, there's also demand was raised from a couple of people um, that if you fill the form, there's a JSON created behind the scene, and if you tweak the JSON manually to fill back the form back and forth, so it's um, um, syncing each other. Um, and also there was a demand raised, and I'm looking forward for your demand, what you have to maybe pre-populate fields with the URL, that you can have maybe a longer pre-populated URL where the user can click on, he will be guided to the form, and some fields will be pre-populated um, if needed. Um, Handling of empty fields was discussed, whether an empty string is an empty string or if it's none, and how about an array, if an array doesn't have an element, is it an empty array or is it null, none, um, how is it treated? Um, also looking forward for opinions from the room here. Um, for me, an empty array is none, but they tend to be use cases where uh, you won't have a difference. 
um, also of coverage for more field types. And, and that's the call for contribution um, as it was introduced in Airflow 2.6. It is now there as, as a base foundation, but it's not limited to. Um, so when we see gaps and bugs, we are trying to fix it. And if you have questions, of course, you can uh, approach me or Chris. Um, so I'm sh shared the code. So we are feeling like a bit of an owner, but not limited to. So we are asking everybody for contribution. Whenever you feel something missing, uh, that's a good starting point for raising your uh, first PR. And so we come to the questions. Um, yeah, the microphone is coming. Um, so if the tag is defined with parameters, can it still be triggered using class? Yeah, yeah. So the UI is just for the interactive use, um, and the REST API didn't change. And the parameters are uh, validated and triggered by the REST API. That's a standard API call. Um, also, um, the parameter structure can be requested via API. So if you query on the API the DAG details, you can get the parameter definition as well. So in theory, you could also render on an external web UI the render the trigger deck, whatever you like to have. So it's, it's just another convenience for users if you direct your users to, to the Airflow UI, but not limited. Any other questions? Uh, great, great idea, because um, we use the, the JSON configuration manually now. Um, it's not easy for everyone. We have a DAG where it runs scheduled, but you can manually trigger it and give it com uh, configuration in the DAG, we're looking for that configuration and changing the behavior. Um, is that impacted by having uh, params defined and default pr uh, params defined? Like, can I still bypass it and to know that it wasn't triggered with conf in the UI? Um, in the UI, you see the DAG run conf. If you go to the grid view and you click on the DAG, you see what conf it was triggered with. Um, and, and the target is a midterm that DECRON, DECRON conf and params are consolidated. At, at the moment, only the DECRON conf is being, being triggered, and there's a, a draft PR consolidating this and with the kind of lead time to, to migrate over. The idea is to get rid of DECRON conf on, on the midterm and, and just put all to parameters. And then the scheduler will take the default parameters because it needs to be automated, non interactive. And every user can override the parameters where parameters make sense, of course. Um, yeah. So basically, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm only 90% sure if somebody else having the answer on if the scheduler triggers the DAG, I believe the default parameters are not printed in the UI. You would need to look up a page. They're just behind the scene, but this, of course, could be improved. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, Chris, Jens, thank you very much. Uh, oh. There's one left over. One. I'm I'm guessing one of the parameters couldn't be a file, but it could be like a file path. If file you upload, you mean? Yeah. And there would be limitations in the amount of Decron conf, and that's serialized to the database and sourced many, 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 many times. Uh, with cases where people pasted then 10,000 lines into the array box, it's working, but then somebody made the mapped operator expanded at 10,000 tasks. And that really brought down the database. So you need to be a bit careful about how much data you serialize in the Decron conf. I would rather post, so as a as practice, I would rather post the reference to the file and the file content itself. Um, so, yeah, we still have two minutes. <laughs> I don't know if you mentioned this, but is it possible to have dynamic, dynamic values like? Loading the default values or the options from a function or an API or, or let's say a function. Yeah, that is something that you need to do as custom code. Um, um, and you need to be careful because the params are parsed and the deck parsing. So if you have dynamic lookups, it's like top level code and variables that you might have to control stuff. So it would slow down the deck processing time because at parse time that would be digested. Um, so Technically speaking, you probably need to inherit the params object and that should be eaten put. Uh, I believe the target is to, for security reasons, to finalize it and, and somehow do it lazy loading. Um, so there might be limitations and that might be an opportunity to talk about in the future how that could be done.
So uh, preventing a slowdown of the deck passing and having that really lazy on the fly whenever you use a maximizer. At the moment, the params are serialized with the deck into the database, and then the web server need to deserialize it from the database to display it because the web server doesn't have its own deck parsing. So structural wise, there are some limitations you need to work around. Um, otherwise, um, if, if, is there a final question? Otherwise, one I would more, ask. There, um, there is one more. Yeah, while you were walking, I, I would ask kind of who has demand in such a thing. There were three raised hands in the beginning. Is it no more? Um, yeah, I was going to ask real quick. We have a few spots where it's specified adding custom HTML. Did we add security pieces there? Any security checking on that? To make sure you can't just like add arbitrary JavaScript code into the form? Um, at the moment, the, the content is taken and trusted. Uh, so at the moment, you need to trust your deck author that he doesn't put a suspicious um, um, JavaScript code in it. Uh, but I have it on my to-do list thinking about sanitizing that. But that's a bit of complex because you still can encode and do things to tweak it so that opens the door of complexity. Rather, maybe we need to make it configurable to turn it off if you don't trust your deck authors. Okay, I think that's it, and uh, it's uh, time for a break. But uh, thank you very much, gentlemen.